Um, oh, would somebody hit the lights back there for me too? I think. Let's let's see if we can see well enough. Can everybody see to take notes still? Is there enough light in the room that you can do that? Okay. I think this will show up a little better if we do that. Um, we talked about muscle tissue a bit at the beginning of the class in our introduction. And what we want to do now is just begin to work with um, the muscular system and its three muscle types. Muscle makes up an enormous amount of your human body. You know, the, there's, there's more muscle tissue than there real, it really is anything else in your human body. And muscle is structured, if you remember a little bit, muscle is structured out of muscle cells. It's mostly a cellular tissue, right? Muscle tissue, too, the other quality that you'd want to describe is the fact that muscle tissue is fibrous. Now, I want to be very careful with that term when I say muscle tissue is fibrous because you don't want to think it's made up of a matrix of fibers like elastic fibers or collagen fibers. That's not what we're saying. A fiber has sort of the characteristic of being long and slender. And when we talk about muscle tissue, we're describing a tissue where the cells are fiber-like. The, the cells are not these little, like, cuboidal cells or squamous cells. They're not little um, cells like we saw in, say, epithelial tissues or even cartilage cells. Even in some of the connective tissues, you have, like, cartilage cells that may be you know, sort of small. These are cells that are quite long, basically, in relationship to their structure. And you would recognize um, this quality, too, in the fact that, um, or from the experience of your connecting with muscle. Think for a minute um, where you would encounter some muscle in your everyday life, right? Well, it would be meat. Meat is, is just animal muscle, isn't it? And if you've ever looked closely at a steak or a piece of chicken, you can see clearly that there are little threads in it. Or think of like shredded beef or shredded chicken, you know, if you get a burrito or something. The, the meat, when it gets all cooked and tenderized and it falls apart, it falls apart into these little threads. You may have even seen that in your cat, in your cat. Right, and dissecting the cat. Sometimes we dissect a little too vigorously and the muscle starts coming apart a little bit and we can see all these threads in it. So muscle is, is very thread-like. You know, when you see muscles like this on a model or on a picture, you can see that there's a thread-like, a fiber-like nature to it. So you first want to get that that concept that we're not dealing with all these little tiny cells for the most part, although you'll see sometimes there might be, but there is this overall sort of thread-like nature to muscle tissue. Now, as we learned in our introductory unit again, muscular system is composed of three types of muscle. There's skeletal, cardiac, and smooth types of muscle. And we just explored very briefly how, how different they were. We know that, for example, like skeletal muscle is voluntary, but it gets tired, right? It wears out. If you try and do it the same thing over and over and over again for too long, it, it kind of gives up. Only with a lot of training do endurance athletes, um, or are they able to do these long-distance runs or long-distance swims or bikes or whatever, we know that cardiac muscle can just go on and on and on for an entire lifetime, for 60, 70, 80, 100 years. It can just keep working and working and working without hardly ever a rest. So there's, there's different qualities here. Now generally, 
we believe that the easiest way to teach you this and for you to begin to explore this is for us to pick one of these types. Let's look at it in depth. Let's look at one of these types really closely, and then we'll take the other two types and compare it and see how is it alike and how is it different. And so we got kind of a head start. Comparing the other two types is fairly easy compared to just learning the basic characteristics. So we're going to do that. Let's, let's take skeletal muscle, okay? We're going to take skeletal muscle, and we're going to look at it in depth. We're going to look at skeletal muscle and see um, all of its characteristics. And these structural things that you're going to learn here are then going to apply right over to your physiology class. We're going to, we're going to hit the structure of this heavy you're going to hit the function of it very heavy in your physiology class. And the student in physiology that's going to do well is a student that's taken the time to do it well here. Right? I'm giving you the foundation to be the A student in physiology. And everything, basically everything we do in here is going to be that very thing for you. Nothing in here is ever wasted. Nothing goes by the wayside. Everything that you learn here is making life better in your future. So you really want to push a little bit. Now besides this handout that we're using, this outline, um, you're going to want a couple of other things right at your elbow. This picture right here is from your textbook. This is figure 9-3. Chapter 9 in your textbook deals with the topic that we're dealing with here, skeletal muscle. Uh, and you may not have this with you today, that's okay, just write this down, and when you go to review this, when you go to look at your notes, you're going to want this picture nearby. This really is the best picture to summarize everything we're going to say. I'm going to kind of lead you right through this picture, basically. And you can probably guess, can't you? You can probably guess that on the next test, you might see this picture, wouldn't you think? Right? You saw a number of pictures from the skeletal system lectures. I always put a few pictures from the muscular system lecture. And this is just a standard one because it summarizes so much of what I'm going to talk to you about here. Um, the other one that can come in handy is something from the past, too. Remember this picture? Remember studying this in the first week for that first quiz? Right? This really shows us a skeletal muscle fiber from the inside. And I love this because, I mean, we've got a picture like this that's an artist's rendition, but all the purples and yellows and blues and greens and stuff here are nice and helpful. But looking at the real thing is helpful too. Remember, this is somebody's muscle cell. No artist drew this. This is an electron micrograph from the real thing. Every little fiber, every mitochondria, every ribosome that you see in there was exactly in that point in that person's muscle cell when this was frozen and imaged. So you're looking at the real thing that we've, we've done. The artists do all these drawings and things because we've got these real images like this. So you may not have this with you again, but you might want to go back in your notes and pull that out and keep that close to help just kind of bring some life and some reality to what we're going to be talking about here. Okay, so let's, just, let's talk now a bit about skeletal muscle. Okay, first of all, muscle cells are the actors on the stage. Okay, we want to start right, I, I like to start at the cellular level and for us to talk about the cells that are involved because these are the things that make it happen. No matter what tissue you're in, the, the reason for the tissue, the things that the tissue done are all cellular activities. Okay, so we've got, we've got to get that clear. Um, Here's an image of a muscle, and you can see we've pulled out some of the fibers here. But you can see somewhat of the fibrous nature of the muscle. 
Um, when, you, when you speak of a whole muscle and you speak of its actors, the actors are sort of supported and arranged, though, in a connective tissue network. If you look all around the little muscles you see here, you see lots of white, don't you? And although the muscles are the actors here, there needs to be a support structure that keeps them together and gives some strength to the muscle some substance of the muscle, even when the muscle cells aren't doing anything. What if my muscle cells are relaxed? Does the muscle just fall apart? No, it doesn't, because woven in and through it are lots and lots of, of connective tissues. So those collagen fibers that we've seen in tendons or ligaments or, or in sheets, you know, in the dermis of our skin, that connective tissue is in and through the muscle itself. Now, one of the things that sometimes trips students up too is the terminology that we use here. I've used the term muscle cell now a couple of times, but in reality, any textbook you go to that's describing skeletal muscle, okay, you will not see the word muscle cells hardly at all because muscle cells okay, are called muscle fibers. Um, if you look on your handout in the upper sort of right-hand corner, right, I've printed this, haven't I? Muscle cells equal muscle fibers because I want to make, I want to get that embedded into your mind. As you're reading paragraphs or looking through notes or whatever, you want to be clear. When you see muscle fibers, you don't want to think like collagen or elastic or something like that. You want to think muscle cells. When I say muscle fibers do this or muscle fibers do that, you need to be thinking, oh, the muscle cells do that. Now, there is sort of a reason why we use the term muscle fibers instead of muscle cells. And part of that comes from the fact that early on, when this was you know, first being discovered, the people that were looking at muscle tissue did not see cells. Because the fibers were so long and fiber-like, they weren't recognized. Like you look at epithelial tissue and you see all these little cuboidal cells or all these little squamous cells. And you, you can see the cells and that's what brought researchers to understand that all living things are cellular in nature. We've got this underlying cell theory to all of biology. But when they looked under the microscope, they would see these things that were extremely long and more thread-like. And so they didn't call these cells initially. They called them fibers. And so that term muscle fiber here has stuck in place of the term muscle cells. And it's, it's interesting to think, especially in the skeletal world, you'll see that the cardiac world and the smooth muscle world are a little bit different. But in the skeletal muscle world, muscle fibers are unusually long. Okay? How long are they? Well, let's use an everyday example for this, okay? What if our muscle fiber, this microscopic little muscle cell, this muscle fiber, <clears throat> since it's a fiber, what if the, the width of the fiber was as big as a football? Okay, you all know about how big a football is. So if I had a muscle fiber that was about that big around, how long would the muscle fiber be? Okay. Its length would be over three football fields long. Okay? Now just think of an object sitting on the football field here that's as big around as the football, but it's as long as three and a half football fields. Okay? The typical cell, the typical epithelial cell, is the size of the football itself. Right? The typical fibroblast or osteoblast or osteocyte is the size of the football. Now here comes a cell that's three football fields long by that standard. Okay? It's, it's just incredibly 
incredibly long, okay? And this is a cell. One single cell membrane, you know, all of the cell structures inside, all of that, but unusually long. Okay, so we're, we're talking about sort of a different kind of cell structure here. Now, how does a cell get that long? Do I have this little cell that all of a sudden can grow that many times bigger? No, I don't. What happens is that very early in human development, while you're still in the womb, little tiny cells come along that are the precursors to these long muscle fibers. And the long ones result from the fusion of many small ones. So just kind of picture many little muscle cells all kind of lining up, right, within muscle tissue, okay? So you've got many, many, many little cells within the muscle tissue. And then picture at some point that they start fusing their cell membranes together, and now all of a sudden I have this great big long muscle fiber where once I had many, many, many little cells. That's how muscle fibers get to be what they are. Now, one of the other interesting things then is that these muscle fibers are multinucleated because when all these little cells fuse together, they don't lose their nuclei, right? The nuclei are retained. And I guess it stands to reason if you were to think, okay, what if I did have a cell that was as big around as a football, but three and a half football fields long, could one nucleus somewhere in there govern and guide the whole thing? Yeah, it just couldn't. What we don't even really understand today is how can all of these nuclei exist within the same cell membrane and all cooperate and get along with one another? And that there must be some way that they just sort of govern their general region of the whole thing. You know, that their blueprint, their DNA kind of governs whatever their general area is. So they, they must all work together somehow. But everything is all within one cell membrane. So it really is a single cell. But it's so unusual that we call it a muscle fiber. So as I use the word muscle fiber over and over and over again, you want to just keep thinking, we're talking about a cell. Here's a picture from your textbook that shows you just a short piece of three separate muscle fibers, right, laying side by side, and you can see, you know, a couple of the nuclei here. If these were as long as they needed to be, you know, you just see spaced along it, you'd see nucleus, 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 nucleus. So this isn't like that polymorphonuclear leukocyte that we saw in our introductory unit that looked like it had three nucleuses, but when I explained it to you, you could see that it was just a single nucleus pinched, and the way it was sliced, it looked like three. This is truly multinucleated. Now, the other thing about this is that since it is so odd... The, the people that first described muscle fibers used special words for its parts. Because they thought this was something a little different, they used different words for its parts. Now, you'd recognize here probably the muscle, right? This, in this picture, here's a bone, right? Only, the only problem I have with this bone is there should be a periosteum on it. There should be a, a layer of white over the outside of this bone. Here's the tendon for the muscle, the connecting link to the bone. Here's the muscle itself. And they've sliced through the muscle so that you can see the muscle fibers are actually in some bundles. And later we'll talk about this whole general muscle structure that makes tissue and organs. Right now we're trying to focus on a muscle fiber Okay, and so this one tube-like structure here with the blood vessels sort of covering over it, this is a single muscle fiber for you to look at. And you can see there's a nucleus, there's a nucleus, there's probably one over there. So here's, here's my cell, and it's sort of cut open so I can see things here. So those we recognize, but let's, let's look at some of the special terms. There's a term sarcolemma. 
The sarcolemma is in reference to the cell membrane. See how they've cut the cell membrane open so that you can see the internal organelles here. The cell membrane of a muscle fiber is called its sarcolemma. So you've got to know that special term. You should be able to identify that. Um, all of the organelles inside collectively, remember we called it cytoplasm when we were looking at cells. Here it's called sarcoplasm. And I'm just pointing to one part there, but that would be, remember the, the cytoplasm was everything except the nucleus that was inside. It was just sort of a collection term. So it's the same collection sort of term here, sarcoplasm. And these uh, little network of structures here are called sarcoplasmic reticulum. What does that sound like? Endoplasmic reticulum, exactly. Now, you're starting to get the message here, aren't you? Sarco, sarco, sarco. Sarco is one of those prefixes that you constantly will see when you're dealing with muscle tissue. Okay? It's one of those standard prefixes. You're either going to see sarco or you're going to see myo. Just like osteo is bone, chondro is cartilage, sarco and myo will show up again and again in reference to muscle kinds of things. Those little tiny cells that fuse into the muscle fibers are called myocytes. I didn't give you that before, and I, I won't test you on that, but you would recognize if you saw myocyte, oh, that's a muscle cell. But those are those little individual ones before they fuse. Okay, so some special terminology when we're talking about this muscle fiber. And remember, this, this represents in the picture, this one tube right here represents the muscle fiber. <clears throat> so just uh, summarizing a bit, right? Muscles are composed of muscle fibers with connective tissues in and around them to hold them together. The individual muscle fibers perform the contractions that when grouped together are going to produce the gross contractions, right? So when I, when I think of grabbing something and having enough force to do something, it's really all of these muscle fibers working together. Each muscle fiber, you know, when I describe it as the size of a football and that, all of that, you know, we're talking still a microscopic. A muscle fiber is microscopic. You can't see it. Although, actually, it's long enough to be seen if it was just wide enough to be seen. Right? Being unusually long, they can be up to a foot long, but they're still microscopic in width. So if there was one laying on the table, you couldn't see it. Now, how does a muscle fiber perform its activity? Well, obviously, it's going to be something internal to the muscle fiber. If this muscle fiber is capable of contraction, and contraction or shortening is the major quality of muscle tissue, it can pull with a force. And if I have all of these muscle fibers collectively doing this big muscle contraction, and the word gross here, you got, today, if we were doing this 50, 100 years ago, everybody would know what the word gross means. It doesn't mean, oh, gag, right? It means just big. It means something that you can see. All right, it's kind of morphed in the English language to mean something different, but here it just means something that you can see. It's, it's a visible, large, activity rather than a microscopic activity. So something about the muscle fiber does this, and it must be something within the cell. And it is. Okay, All muscle fibers have a special organelle within them. And that's what you see here with this green and purple band-like structure to it. Okay, They have a special organelle, and they have many, many of these organelles that are the contracting organelles of the muscle fiber. And that contracting organelle 
is known as a myofibril. How many myofibrils do you see in this picture? How many myofibrils do you see v visible in this image? One? How many? I hear some fives. Do you see five? One, two, three, four, five. Each of these is cut short. This one extends out so that you can see it. Every myofibril is a long tube-like structure that's found within the sarcoplasm of the cell. Okay, so the muscle fiber is full of myofibrils. Okay, as much as 80% of the sarcoplasm of the muscle fiber, the typical muscle fiber, is myofibrils. Because that's what the cell is here for, right? It's here for contracting, so it builds and maintains its myofibrils. Right? These didn't come from the store. Remember, every, let's go back to our introduction. Remember, every, everything within a muscle fiber was built by that cell, which is the same as every ribosome, every mitochondria, every bit of structure in any cell was produced by that cell. This cell just happens to tap into that part of the genetic code that tells it to build myofibrils within itself. And so we're coming right down to the structure here. The myofibrils are the contracting units of the muscle fiber, right? They are what make things happen. And likewise, you can then begin to think the more myofibrils there are inside, the more contractive force, right? So what if, what if one muscle cell has five myofibrils in it and another muscle fibril, fiber has 10 myofibrils in it? How would you compare the contractive force between those two? One would be twice as strong as the other, wouldn't it? If these are the pulling units, the contracting units, and one has more, one has less, then you're going to have more force. So really the, the strength, if you will, of any one muscle fiber is due to how many my, myofibrils. Can a cell have more or less myofibrils in it? Yes, it can. In fact, when we talk about the strength of a muscle, of course we're talking about the strength of all of its muscle fibers, um, think about exercise. Exercise produces larger muscles, right, and stronger muscles. But it doesn't do that by increasing how many muscle fibers there are in the muscle. The number of muscle fibers in the muscle is dictated at birth, basically. You have as many muscle fibers as you're going to have, basically, right from the moment you're born. But, right, the growth of the muscle is within each and every one of those muscle fibers. Every muscle fiber is capable of building more and more and more myofibrils within itself. And if this muscle fiber had 10 myofibrils in it, it would be twice as big around as it is right now, wouldn't it? And if every muscle fiber in the muscle did that, the whole muscle would be twice as big as it is right now. It would have the same number of muscle fibers in it, but every muscle fiber would be stronger because it's got more myofibrils in it. And this, in essence, is exactly what happens when a person exercises, when they work out. If you start a weight training class, as your, as your fibers build more and more muscle fiber or more and more myofibrils within each muscle fiber, then you gain in strength, you gain in uh, 
uh, and the ability of each one of the, the muscle fibers to lend its strength to the entire muscle. Now, this isn't a complete picture. There's a lot more that goes on, but this is the basic essence of that. Um, when people work out, their muscles get sore. Typically what happens is some of these myofibrils break down. They just they try and contract, and they, they start coming apart a little bit. And so then the muscle says, oh, I've got to repair these. I've got to put these all back together. And part of what the muscle fiber says is, you know, I, I really don't want that to happen again. Let's make some more here so that we're able to handle what's being thrown at us. And your entire human body does this. Your body adapts to the stresses you put on it. You learned that in the last unit. Bones get stronger when you work them. The more exercise you do, the more dense your bones become. Well, likewise, the stronger your muscles become because as you throw more effort at them, they respond by building more myofibrils to handle what you're throwing at them. Strength, you know, it's, it's like this class. I mean, you can look at it in every aspect, bones, muscles. How about nerve tissue? You get smarter. You get more capable intelligently, not by doing the same things you do every day, but by taking a mental challenge, by taking a class like this. By, by reading things that are interesting and that are beyond where you are now. And your brain grows and you learn more. And the more you learn, the more you can learn. But it's, it's certainly true here. If you push the muscle fibers to do more than they're capable of, they will respond by making themselves more capable, by building more myofibrils. Okay? Okay? And that's, and that's where more muscular strength comes from. Now, let's look at this picture that hopefully you remember from early on. And at first, when we were looking at this, okay, we didn't talk about all of these thread-like things that you see here. We were interested in identifying mitochondria, nucleus, nucleolus, cell membrane, ribosomes, smooth and rough endoplasmic reticulum. We were trying to identify all the parts of the cell, and we just ignored a lot of the rest of this. But now it's time to look at the rest of this here. Here are the myofibrils. Now, remember, a myofibril is a circular structure, isn't it? Right? And here we just have a slice lengthwise through a muscle fiber. So we don't really see the roundness of this. looks sort of rectangular here. But try to picture the, each one of these things here as a tube-like structure. Okay? Let's, let's highlight a couple of these. Okay? So there's two out of the four and a half, five. And these muscle fibers, or these myofibrils here aren't short. They're just kind of going behind some of this other structure. So it looks like things are coming in and out, but they're not. They're just some of the other organelles are covering over them or behind them or whatever. But you can still see three and a half, three, you know, three and several parts of the myofibrils in this one image. Okay, you want to picture them, you know, circularly. Now, as you look at any one myofibril here, okay, what you see is some vertical lines here, don't you? See these dark black lines? And we have a name for those. They're an essential part of this skeletal muscle structure. And they kind of divide up the entire myofibril into pieces, don't they? If you look at those black lines, if you think this whole thing is a myofibril, and you look at it closely, you see a very repetitious structure within the myofibril, don't you? Right? And it's divided by these black lines. And so this is just one of those units then within the myofibril. The myofibril is nothing more than many, many of these units. Just look at them. See, there's one there. One there, here's the next one, right? There's one there, 
There's one here. So I'm coming down to the contracting. I'm trying to get to the contracting structure. So I've got a myofibril, but it's divided into these individual pieces. It's divided into pieces here. And what we want to do is we want to focus on one of these. The little boundaries that are here, or before I get to that, I'm trying to get to that, but I'm not getting there. Um, what we want to do is identify one of these pieces right here, like we've done right there. Okay? And that is called the sarcomere of the myofibril. Okay, so there's, there's that little prefix sarco again. Okay, this one unit of the entire myofibril is called the sarcomere. And that is, that is a key word for you, that term sarcomere. And the boundaries of the sarcomere then... Um, are going to be these structures that are called Z-discs. Okay? So all the way along there, you see different places where you've got Z-discs. So the Z-discs separate these myofibrils one from the other. And this is then the contracting unit of the myofibril. The myofibril contracts because each one of its sarcomeres contract. Does that make sense? We keep talking about contracting. We started with the muscle. We said muscle is made up of muscle fibers. We say, oh, but within the muscle fiber, what contracts are these myofibrils? And now we're finally saying, oh, but these myofibrils are made up these, of these smaller units called sarcomeres. And this is where the action is. When I go to pick up something heavy, it's really a numbers game, isn't it? I've got muscles made of many muscle fibers. But within each of those muscle fibers are many myofibrils. And within each of those myofibrils are many sarcomeres. And it's the contraction of millions and millions of sarcomeres that is really the ultimate contraction of the entire muscle. So within the cellular structure of this muscle fiber, we've brought the entire contraction down to this one structural piece of it, one portion of an entire myofibril. And let, let me give you just a little bit of caution, a little bit of advice right here. It's very easy for this whole thing to become very confusing. Have you noticed there's a lot of M words and F words here, isn't there? Right? There's muscle fibers, myofibrils. You're going to see some other M's and F's coming up here, and it's very easy to confuse these. My best study tip to everyone is always to rewrite your notes on the same day that you take them. Don't let a day go by. If you take notes in a class like you're taking now, if you don't look at these until tomorrow or the next day, right, the, there's going to be a lot of confusion in your mind. If you look at these notes again today and you write them into nice, neat outlines, you're going you're gonna to pick up twice as much from this. You're going to retain twice as much as you do if you put it off to some other day. Many people are in the habit, oh, they take good notes in class, but if they look like mine, they're just kind of bits and pieces are all over the place. If you'll rewrite those notes the same day before you go to bed, it doesn't, you know, if it's right after the class or if it's in the evening or whatever, if you will rewrite those before you go to sleep, you will make better notes and you will retain two or three or four times as much as you would otherwise. And I know for me, I went from being an okay student to a great student when I did that one thing. But it's, it's nowhere more true than here. This whole thing, 
with all of these tube-like structures and all of these M words and F words and all of that, it's just easy for this to get very confusing very quickly. I'm hoping that you'll come out of this lecture really understanding this, or at least coming very close to understanding it. But if you let it go till some other day, it's going to get much more muddled and much more confusing. Okay, so let's do this. Let's take one sarcomere now and let's look at one sarcomere, okay? Can we do that? Let's focus right here now on what's going on within this. Okay, this is the contracting unit. Now, remember the, the picture that I'm showing you right here. This is the real thing. This is real life. These, this is the sarcomere of some living human being or somebody that once lived. Every little bit of structure that you see here was right there when this thing was frozen. Now, what I see between these two Z-discs then is a bunch of threads, don't I? You see that? There's a bunch of threads here. And these threads are responsible for the contraction. We call these threads myofilaments. Okay, another M word, F word, right? We call these myofilaments. And you'll see that there are two types of of myofilaments here. Let me kind of show those to you. Um, let's focus on one at a time. If we look at our Z-discs here, and remember, I'm, these look like lines, and some books will call these Z-lines because we're looking at a two-dimensional picture. But you want to think the myofibril is circular, right? So a wall that goes completely through a circular structure is going to be a disc shape, isn't it? Like a coin. Wouldn't it? Now look at the end, if you've got a can, a can is a cylinder, right? If you look at one end of the can, it's a disc. So these, these are Z-discs. Look first at the threads that are attached to the Z-disc, right? From both Z-discs, there are threads extending out, not quite all the way to the center, but quite a ways out. Those are called actin myofilaments. And they're called that because the protein that makes them up is actin. Sometimes they're called the thin myofilaments because you can see they're a little bit thinner than the other thread that I see here. And these ones that hover sort of here in the middle, they don't have an attachment to the Z-disc. These ones that sort of hover in the middle that are thicker are called myosin myofilaments. Myosin myofilaments or thick myofilaments. And it's the interaction of these two things, these myosins and actins, it's their interaction that creates the cellular contraction. So it's, it's not real tough. I got these Z disks and I've got these two kinds of threads and it's their interaction. And you can see they're all geometrically you know, arranged in there. You want to know the actin myofilaments and pick them out. You want to pick out the myosin myofilaments. Let's, um, let's do that with part of this picture. See, we've got this picture with the muscle fiber here and the myofibril coming out. And then see how they've taken a bit of the myofibril and they've diagrammatically shown us the sarcomere here. Can you see this? Here, let's, let's just isolate that one part of the picture right here, okay? So here is the artist's rendition of the sarcomere. Now basically, you want to think that there are five structural components of the sarcomere. If you can pick out five structural objects in this picture, then you've got the basic parts that you need to know. Now three of them here you already know, don't you? Okay, do you know where the Z-disc is in this picture? What color is the Z-disc? Yeah, it's blue, okay? The Z-disc is this sort of zigzag blue structure in the picture. It looks much more formidable in the electron micrograph. 
okay? But it's, you know, it, they represent it here as this, this blue line there. You know the actin myofilament, right? They're the purple ones. The actins are attached to, directly attached to the Z-discs, aren't they? And see how one sarcomere is really attached to the next sarcomere, isn't it? Because the actins of one are linked to the actins of the other by way of the Z-disc, right? So there's not a separate Z-disc for one sarcomere and another Z-disc for another. They share Z-discs and their actins are likewise linked in. The green picture here is what? What is it? Right, this is the myosin myofilament. Okay, is the green one. And it just seems to hover here in the center. Now with this diagram, you can see there's a little bit more. You can see these little... Um, these little armature things here coming off the myosin here that are going to link it to the actin. And so it's going to be this interaction of myosin and actin that's actually going to cause the contraction here. There's two other elements here that you should be able to identify. Now, one of these is just recent. Okay, we've known for a long time that there was a protein in here called Titan, but we really didn't know what role it played until recently. This is only the second edition of the textbook to show this picture right here, right? This sort of gray little structure here that you can see running through is called the Titan filament. Let me call your attention to this. This is not a myofilament. This is just simply a filament. What's the difference? Myofilaments are involved in the contraction itself. Filaments are not. What does it look like the Titan does here? Can you guess? Yeah, it just holds it all together. See, we didn't, because when these two are interacting, I get a shortening. What's happening? What's keeping this all together when they're not shortening? When Myosin and actin are not connected to each other when they're not contracting. What holds this all together? Well, it's this titan filament that links one Z-disc to the other. And notice they've, they've drawn it so that it's kind of elastic. See how it's spring-like? So I can actually stretch a muscle, can't I? And yet it doesn't come apart. So it's not like the sarcomere is fixed. I can actually stretch the sarcomere wider and it'll spring back. So the titan is really the, the object that holds it all together internally when the, when the myosin and the actin are not doing their contracting thing. So the titan filament is important, but it doesn't have anything to do with contraction. The last element, the fifth element here that you want to identify is the M line. And there is a structural protein here that runs through the center of the sarcomere that links all of the myosins to one another. Um, if you think back to the electron micrograph that we were using, you would see uh, some little dark, thick dots right in the middle of each myosin, and they're all linked together by a protein. And that's partly what keeps the myosins all lined up so geometrically within the sarcomere. Um, if you had that cell picture with you and you look back at it, it's just amazing how everything is so geometrically lined up within each and every sarcomere. And the M line is part of that. So when it comes down to contraction, structurally it's not, this is not super difficult, right? If you know these five elements here, if you can identify these, you're likely to see this picture, right, by itself on the test where you'd have to identify or label, you know, one or more of these parts. You should know the structural parts of the sarcomere here. Once you know this, then it's, um, it's fairly easy to then work into, okay, well, how does contraction happen? When you know the parts, you can talk about the function. And as, as I've been saying, it's the interaction between the actin and the myosin that does this. 
Let's, let's give an example. We don't want to do a lot of physiology here, but you've seen the structure now. So let's just kind of talk for a minute, just briefly. I want to give you just a very, very basic example of this, okay? An example of the myosin act, act and interaction would be pulling on a rope, okay? When you pull on a rope, something comes closer to you, doesn't it? When you think of pulling on a rope, one part of this is active and one part of this is passive. Are the arms active or the arms passive? They're active, aren't they? Is the rope active or passive? The rope is passive. Is the rope doing anything to get the, if he's pulling something closer to himself, is the rope doing anything to get it closer? No, it's the arms, isn't it? And likewise, okay, the myosin is the active element here. The myosin molecule is like the arms, right? And the rope then, Okay, the rope or actin is like, or the actin is like the rope. It's not really doing anything, but it's there for the myosin to grab onto and pull. So think of a myosin molecule in the middle of that thing pulling, right? And think of the actin molecule as being there pulled on. Let's sort of illustrate that from what we've done before. Here's a picture from your textbook that shows two sarcomeres. Can you see them? Right? And here's the actins and the myosins, right? The Z disks, look at the Z disks here, and picture that these myosins are pulling on these ropes. And this end of the myosin is pulling on these ropes. What's going to happen to the Z disks? They're going to come closer together, aren't they? They're going to be pulled in toward the center of the sarcomere. Now, just watch how this happens, right? See how they're being pulled? Right? Closer. Close. Okay, so what was once this long is now this long. Right? The myosins have come very close to the Z disks now. They've been pulling on these actins. The actins have come so close together that they're overlapping, and each sarcomere is shorter. What happens when each and every sarcomere in a myofibril is shorter? The whole myofibril is shorter. And since the muscle fiber is made up of all these myofibrils, the whole muscle fiber is much shorter. Right? So it's this interaction. It's, we call this the sliding filament theory because they're not like something getting shorter. The actin isn't any shorter. The myosin isn't any shorter. They're the same length that they always were, but they're sliding by each other. I kind of don't like the term sliding because I always think of sliding as passive. You know, when you're a kid, you climb up the slide, and then what do you do? You do nothing, right? You just let gravity do it for you. And that's not what's happening here. These myosins are actively pulling, like pulling on a rope. It's work. It uses energy. The mitochondria are providing the energy for these myosins to work. So I'd prefer a working sliding filament theory or something, you know, that is not so passive in its terminology. But it's the idea that these things are not... The, the filaments themselves are not getting any shorter. They're just sliding past each other so that the entire sarcomere gets shorter. That makes sense? Let's, um, let's, let's do a little physical example of this. Um, let me do a little thing up here. I need four volunteers to come up and help me with this. Anybody want to come up here? I just knew Angela. Okay, I need one more. Here comes Samantha. Okay, hold hands. Okay, now stretch out. Just stretch out as far as you can. Okay, we're going to be a myofibril, right? And I'm a sarcomere. Angela's a sarcomere. Samantha's a sarcomere. Shanae, Cindy, we're all sarcomeres, okay? But we're all linked. Where are, you see us holding hands, that's our Z-discs, aren't they? Now, I'm a sarcomere, so I can shorten. 
Okay, now look how far it is from Cindy's arm way over there all the way over to Samantha's arm way over there. All right? Now, we're each going to shorten. We're each going to pull our hands towards our shoulders, okay? Now, see, we're all going to have to slip and slide, aren't we? Right? Okay? Now, see how my overall myofibril is much shorter, isn't it? I only had to do one little thing, but because we all did one little thing, we've got a huge contraction. Okay, let's relax now. Now we're relaxed, okay? And we spread back out. Okay, and see how long we are? Okay? So I can get a great big huge contraction from little tiny microscopic things when there's many, many, many of them all working together. That makes sense? Okay, give our volunteers a hand. Well done. Okay? I can get this big muscle contraction here with my muscles when I've got jillions of little tiny sarcomeres each doing their little thing within a myofibril. Okay, and that's, that's the basis. Now, when you get to physiology, you're going to be learning how does the ATP get, you know, generated by the mitochondria, and how does it get in here, and what does ATP do to the myosin to give it the ability to work, and all of that. And you're going to learn about these little parts that are coming out of the myosin here. They're called cross bridges, and how do they attach to the actin, and you're going to go much more in depth. But if you'll take this foundation with you, you'll be way ahead of any other student that's come in from somewhere else and maybe didn't get all of this, okay? You're really going to know your stuff. So you want to you wanna work with this, and work with this again today, please. I can't emphasize that enough. You've got to go over this again. Um, you should, within a day or so, be able to see this whole presentation online, too, if you want to go on Blackboard. Um, this should be online for you to see if you want to go through it again. Okay, so let's, let's just kind of get to a summary place here. Oh, why did that disappear? That wasn't supposed to disappear. Okay, sorry about that. I, I wanted to show you, mm, I wanted to show you that, go back to that, and make sure that you can take that cell picture, okay, and make sure you can go through that and see the, the actin myofilaments and the myosin myofilaments. You can't see a titan in there, and that's why it took so long to figure out titan, because we couldn't even see it in the electron micrographs. You can see the Z-discs, you can see actin, you can see myosin, you can see where the M-line is, but you can't see the titan because it's so small. But, but that just really lays out the whole cellular structure for you. And then, of course, this image from your textbook really summarizes it all. You don't have to do anything with the muscle here yet. This will be part of next week's lecture. We'll be getting to this right here. But what you want to focus on, can you pick out the muscle fiber? Can you pick out its various parts? Can you then focus on the myofibrils and the sarcomeres? Make sure you think, too, what is a contracting unit for what? Okay, for example, let me just walk you through this, right? The sarcomere is the contracting unit of the myofibril. This thing contracts because it's got all these little units within it. But then this myofibril would be the contracting unit for the muscle fiber, right? Because it's many, many of these myofibrils that are the units within the muscle fiber. And then the muscle fibers are the contracting units of the muscle itself, right? And can you see how I might ask that? I might say, what are the contracting units of the muscle fiber? You'd tell me it's the myofibrils. What are the contracting units of the myofibrils? Oh, the sarcomeres, right? See, the you can probably see here another point of confusion, too, for the student that hasn't really looked at this. See how everything here is tubular? It's a tube inside a tube inside a tube inside a muscle. It's so easy, if you don't really know this, to get confused about which tube you're at. You could be thinking, oh, this is the myofibril inside the muscle fiber. It's easy to get lost here with all the M words and F words and all the tube light. Everything is tubes inside of tubes inside of tubes. So please take some time to get this right in your mind and then just start reviewing it, 
Learn more and more elements as you go along, but you want to sort of cement it into your mind today if you can. Get that foundation in your brain so that you can keep learning this. It won't happen if you look at it tomorrow or Sunday or Monday or that. Okay? Any, any last questions here? Let me see if there's anything else we need to ask or talk about. Got that? Okay. Good deal. Thanks for your...